All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're gonna wait for uh, folks to enter into the room and instead of waiting in silence this time, uh, I'm gonna entertain you with some zombie jokes to get you in the mood for these talks. Um, so first of all, uh, why did the zombie become a hypnotist? Uh, because she preferred her brains washed. <laughs> How did zombies uh, travel west? They follow the Oregon, the Oregon Trail. <laughs> and lastly, uh, how do you know if a zombie really likes you? They ask for seconds. <laughs> Although I have heard that you shouldn't be telling zombie jokes because they can return to bite you. <laughs> All right, so I will end with that. And it looks like we have a pretty full room. So I wanted to... Uh, um, welcome everyone. This is going to be a really fun event. Um, I will put a little warning that it's probably not appropriate for children. Um, so just to be aware of that. Um, but we're really excited to present to you Zombies, Chestbursters, and Ghosts in the Darkness. This is a collaborative presentation with Dr. K uh, Ken Catania and myself. Um, Dr. Ken Catania is a Stevenson professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. He received his bachelor's from the University of Maryland and while he was doing that, he also worked as a research assistant at the National Zoo, where he did some really interesting work. He um, completed his master's and his PhD from the University of California at San Diego, working with uh, Dr. Glenn Norcutt. And his research in biological and also neurosciences spans everything from zombie cockroaches to electric eels and star-nosed moles. Uh, he has been named as a MacArthur Fellow and received the Prattles Research Award in Neurosciences from the National Academy of Science, uh, Na the National Academy of Sciences. He has not only published numerous papers, but his work has been featured uh, in the popular press, including frequent appearances on Science Friday. And to add to all of his accolades, uh, he's not just an amazing researcher, but his research has resulted in a Guinness Book of World Records, which I think is quite amazing. Um, if you haven't already picked up uh, his book, I would. It is called Great Adaptations. And what's really fun about it is that there are actually these QR codes in the book, and then it, it links you to YouTube videos. So you actually get the full immersive experience. Um, Dr. Catania's research can literally cause you to have nightmares. So it is no coincidence um, and very fitting that he is speaking today. And so with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Catania. Well, thank you so much for that really kind introduction and for plugging the book. I didn't know you were gonna do that. So thanks so much. So I'm glad everybody could make it today and I uh, hope everybody can see everything and hear me. Um, and I'm gonna kick things off by talking about the zombies and chestbursters side of this uh, equation, I guess. And I'm gonna tell you about some recent findings in the lab and also how um, some interesting species can serve as a model species for other kinds of studies. And this is a theme that I know is familiar to many of you. Um, it's certainly a theme that uh, runs through my own laboratory and that theme being model species. And so um, I'm sort of leveraging what's often called Krog's principle here. And August Krog was a Danish physiologist and he got the Nobel Prize in 1920. And one of the things that he pointed out was that for a large number of problems, there's a species of choice uh, in which it can be most conveniently studied. And so I'm gonna start by telling you about this animal of choice that I think is a really fascinating species, a really fun species and super appropriate for talking about on Halloween. And that species is the emerald jewel wasp. And I don't wanna assume that everybody knows the, the, the background of this wasp, so I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go along. Um, I'm gonna start by telling you that it was sort of introduced to the biological world by a guy named Francis Williams, who was an accomplished entomologist of the time. Um, he had his own challenges going on uh, during his time. He actually presented his research on this wasp about two weeks after Pearl Harbor while working in Honolulu. And what he had done was introduce this amazing wasp to the islands because it is a wasp that goes after the American cockroach and it really um, uh, does some amazing things. It basically stings it twice, once in the foreleg or in the, in the first thoracic ganglion, paralyzing the front legs and then stinging it in the head, which essentially pacifies it. 
and then it drags this uh, uh, the cockroach to a tomb, lays an egg on it, and barricades it in, and then uh, really bad things happen after that, which I'm going to describe some of those. Um, so um, the other side to this, though, is what uh, problems can be addressed by using a model species like this. And for this, uh, you know, it's fun to do the Halloween thing, but I also want to talk about a serious problem. And this is an invasive species. Um, it has not spread all that far. And um, this is Internecivus uh, raptus. Um, it's, it's not yet been published on very much. And most of what we know about this species comes from one uh, pioneering uh, person at the forefront of this who uh, has told us most of what we know about this. And this person is Warrant Officer Ellen Ripley. And some of you may have heard some of the stories about what has gone on with this species. Um, it's been in the news a little bit. Um, and essentially, she was the sole survivor of a mining expedition. And this mining expedition was on the Nostromo. This is a deep space mining ship. And essentially, what happened was on their return trip, they received some unusual signals from a, a moon. It wasn't actually a planet. It was a moon that's been designated LV-426. And they basically decided that this needed to be investigated. And so they, they uh, sent a, an exploratory group of people to go find out what was going on. And we do have some video records of what happened. And so I'm going to just start off by showing you what these guys found, because there's a lot of biology to sort of unpack in this situation. So I'm going to play you guys this video. Do you see anything? Uh, a cave. A cave, a cave of some sort, but I... Well, I don't know, but it's like the goddamn tropics in here. This is completely enclosed, and it's full of laminary objects, like eggs or something. Okay, so obviously something went on there. That was a, a, an unusual situation. Lots of eggs in there. Um, you know, what's going on with the biology of this species? Well, they returned to the ship. And I did want to show an image of what was going on there because this is what he looked like when he returned. And so there's both the biology to think about what's going on with this intermediate stage of this parasitoid. But there's something else I wanted to highlight. And clearly this guy's face mask is not intact. And there are some serious CDC guidelines to think about when you're talking about a, a face mask like this. And uh, once again, Ellen uh, Ripley was at the forefront of sort of, of standing up to the commercial interests in this case. You know, it's something that we can think about and resonates with us today. And so I want to just play you another aspect of the record for this. What kind of thing? I need a clear definition. Open the hatch. Wait a minute. We let it in. The ship could be infected. You know the quarantine procedure. 24 hours for decontamination. It could die in 24 hours. Open the hatch. Listen to me. If we break quarantine, we could all die. You know, prescient words there, I would say. 
Um, you know, a tragedy could have been avoided had the guidelines been followed. I think that can resonate with most of us. And I do want to now sort of uh, fast forward to uh, what was going on there. And so essentially what you have is a parasitoid and it has a lot of parallels with the parasitoid I'm going to talk about, except there's an intermediate stage here. Uh, it has clearly affected the nervous system of the host in this case. And it is, in fact, depositing an egg at this point. And so, again, I'm going to I'm going to continue to draw these parallels. But I also uh, wanted to show you essentially what goes on after the egg uh, emerges. And for this part, I'm going to just tell you that the next 30 seconds are a little disturbing. Um, so, if you want to take 30 seconds off, I'm not going to show you the whole at the whole uh, emergence of this parasitoid but I'm gonna show you sort of the end of it so you can see that. So here we go. Okay, so what we now know about this juvenile form, an early instar, uh, is that this is the adult of the species. And just to now highlight, you know, I was amazed when I went through some of these characteristics. It's clearly a parasitoid, has an exoskeleton, depresses the host's central nervous system for egg deposition, entombs the host. I'm going to come back to that. Larva feeds inside the host before exiting the chest region. And these are all amazingly similar to Ampulex uh, uh, compressa. And um, so that also reminds me, I think this is a potentially a great opportunity for a grant. I think NIHA would go for this model system. Maybe we could have a TIP submission, transinstitutional investigations, all kinds of things. So, but that's for another time. So um, what I wanted to talk about next is essentially um, the model species, and this is Ampulex compressa, and it goes after only the American cockroach when it is in need of reproduction. So this is a female. And essentially this species has been studied since 1940 and there's been dozens and dozens of papers on this and it's got a really amazing reproductive strategy. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the, 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 the reviews and I did wanna also highlight a couple of laboratories, the Liebersat lab, and the Adams lab working on the venom have really pioneered our understanding of this particular species, how it manipulates the nervous system of the host, how it reproduces and the basic ethogram of what is going on. And so I'm gonna describe that for you next and tell you about the, the two stings that this wasp is known to make into the central nervous system of the cockroach. So there's a first sting and this is into the thoracic ganglion and that paraly paralyzes the front legs. And that allows for a very directed second sting that is into the brain, directly into the brain of the cockroach. And after that, this, uh, the wasp will essentially go off and find a hole, a nest in which to embed the cockroach. It'll take a blood meal from the antenna. It'll transport the host. Then you have overposition and entombment. Now um, that happens regularly unless the cockroach defends itself. And some of you may remember uh, the last presentation I gave on this species um, where uh, there's a really kind of an amazing defensive strategy of the cockroach that was kind of underappreciated. And that is given that the cockroach has this exoskeleton with these spiny back legs, it can defend itself by kicking the wasp in the head. And so, uh, because the wasp leads with the head and in fact, if the cockroach gets in five or six blows to the head, it will deter the wasp. The wasp will break off the attack. It'll go and it'll search for another host and basically give up. Now, um, keeping with the theme of model systems here, I did want to point out the problem that we have when we think about adopting this strategy. The problem is, of course, we don't have an exoskeleton this species has an exoskeleton. That's just you know a hard thing to deal with. But once again, Officer Ripley was ahead of her time in thinking about what to do about this. And essentially, she came up with her own exoskeleton. So I'm going to play a clip for you here. <laughs> Away 
from her, you bitch. But you may have noticed, exact same strategy. Exoskeleton, slam the parasitoid in the head. That seems to be one of the best things you can do. Now, I did want to extend what goes on with this particular species. And because I had mentioned that there's an entombment phase, and this was clearly brought out on the second visit to LV426. And um, so I'm going to show you a little bit. And again, think about the biology here, the egg positioning, the host positioning, and so forth. Okay, so clearly the host is still alive, uh, has been brought to this crypt, you might call it, this sort of entombed there, position there, another similarity we've got going on. And I know it's easy to concentrate on you know, sort of the, the marine side and all that, but I also want you to think about the challenges that the actual parasitoid has, egg positioning, what are the sensors that might be used to detect the host, um, and so forth, because I think that's sort of an open book that we could explore. And now what I want to do is talk a little more about this particular species. And what I'm going to show you is the sequence of entombment and the attack the wasp uses against the cockroach that I've described. So this will be sped up very much, but you'll be able to sting, see sting one, sting two, and then the entombment uh, process. And also the, uh, I've inserted in here a free will test that will allow you to basically see that the nervous system has been permanently changed. So there's sting two to the brain. Now, importantly, the wasp is looking for a pre-existing hole and I've only given one hole in this chamber, in this arena. Now the, the wasp clips the antenna and takes a blood meal from the antennal stump. So there's drinking of hemolymph here. And this is the free will test where I provided two arenas. This first area is obviously where the cockroach would want to stay. It's got confectionery, cookies, donuts, even some pizza and cake and so forth. At, on this is going downhill very quickly. This is not the place that you would want to be. Um, and it just progresses to be very bad karma as, as things move along here. And I, I should point out egg laying occurs now in that crypt essentially. And I have provided only one thing for the wasp to use to barricade the entrance. And so it basically, I'm leveraging the instinctive behavior of this wasp and it uses the treasure chest to essentially block things in there. So um, I, you know, similar kind of behavior. And I also wanted to highlight something about the fact that this wasp does this, right? So I can set this up to essentially show you this very kind of amusing setup for where the wasps and how the wasp entombs things. And that means I can do something else, obviously, that's much easier. And what I can do is flip a microscope upside down and film what goes on in the entombing chamber because essentially few people have ever looked at the details close up of the egg laying procedure for this particular species. And so that's what I want to move into next. And I'm really going to concentrate mostly on this species now from for the rest of the talk, though I did want to tell you um, what the main question was. And I am sort of hope you don't mind me taking this invasive species lightly here. But um, the question is that um, normally people think of the face hugger phase as a you know, a terror that is basically going to get its way to, to subdue its host and reproduce. And my question is, is it really that easy for these parasitoids? Maybe the behavior of the female uh, parasitoid is more important than we have given credit for. And so for in, in the case of the wasp, 
uh, what I'm going to, this is, so this is a scanning electron micrograph of an emerald jewel wasp. And it turns out there's a bunch of little hairs on the base of its abdomen. Uh, this is a higher magnification of those hairs. And they use these hairs to investigate the legs of the cockroach when they lay the egg. And they always lay on either, on the second leg, either the left or the right second leg. So my question was, what goes on uh, with these hairs? So first, I want to show you this exploratory process. This is sped up. And the upper right panel is essentially showing you the pattern of movements traced from video to show you that they really have to explore a large portion of this lar this part of the, the leg to before they lay the egg. Uh, that's called the uh, cockroach coxa. And basically, um, that is an obligatory site for where the egg actually goes. Now, um, it's uh, not exactly the same as what goes on. Um, but there are very striking similarities um, in terms of the, 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 the egg issue. And, and by that, I'm going to show you the next phase of a wasp. And so what goes on after the egg hatches, you might think, well, it's not the same as what you might call the xenomorph uh, that we've been talking about. Um, but in fact, this grub does end up inside the cockroach to complete its phase. And so I want to show you this sped up. And uh, it, will, it will feed, this is actually about two days uh, worth of growth. And you know, when I first saw the alien uh, growth depicted aboard the Nostromo, I thought it grew a little faster than I could believe based on the data that they brought back. But actually these parasitoids grow really frighteningly fast. And this is the case here as well. And in it goes. Now at that point, it's basically going to feed on the inside from the inside of the cockroach from that point on. And you know, to go back to uh, you know what goes on with our uh, uh, our other parasitoid, if you do a scan, yeah, it's I was just it's feeding him oxygen. Paralyzes him, puts him in a coma. Keeps them alive. What the hell is that? Okay, so that's really, you don't want to see that on your MRI. Uh, that's definitely bad news. Um, and just to sort of draw out the comparison a little more, uh, here is what we can do for, you know, the equivalent of a scan. And um, you would not want to see this. So there's the parasitoid. And I'm going to let this play for just a minute. Here it's sped up. Here's the beating heart you might see uh, in the middle of the screen. And at the top, what those fast wiggling things, that is actually the jaws of the ravenously feeding parasitoid that is eating the inside of the cockroach while the cockroach is alive. It's essentially eating it alive um, very as quickly as it can and growing very, very rapidly. Okay, so uh, so many parallels here. Now, going back to sort of the question that I was talking about, so there's the, there's the jaws. You can see them really clearly there. So that's on the inside of the cockroach. Okay, so to tell you about a little bit of data. So this is the normal, this is the normal egg position for 25 eggs. And this is the normal angle. So the dotted lines are each one standard deviation. And so it goes in a very regular position. And in fact, if you look at where the larva feeds, it generally, in, in fact, it is obliged to feed at this one membrane here. Uh, and so this is 100 trials and where did the larva bite? Uh, and it always feeds at this one membrane. So that is an important aspect of their biology, getting back to the female behavior side of things. And so the question was, what happens if you take off these hairs? And so the, these are scanning EMs of these wasps with the hairs trimmed off. And now I wanna show you over position for uh, some of these cases where the hairs were removed. And what you'll see is in fact, it's quite abnormal. Um, and you know, you might say, well, that's still on the second leg. Maybe that's not a big deal. It's a huge deal. That larva died. This one uh, is also getting close to this membrane here. I should, if you can see the pointer, that's the membrane. 
that's at a very weird angle. And that egg also died. And partly because the femur of the cockroach knocked it off. And in fact, if you trace, if you follow the larva that are from these abnormally laid eggs, this is the membrane here, um, these larva all died. And they die partly because the larva is terrible at navigating and moving outside on the outside of the cockroach. So this really emphasizes the critical need of the female wasp to pick just the right spot to lay the egg. Um, so this, this is a very helpless larva and only if its head emerges right there is it good at actually breaking through the membrane, taking a blood meal and then entering the cockroach. Now um, that brought up an entirely different challenge for the female wasp. And that challenge is the, what if the femur of the cockroach is blocking the oviposition site and the place that it needs to search in order to choose the right oviposition site. And so that's what's highlighted here in red. And in fact, this is something that is not all that uncommon to see. And I'm going to um, basically show you an example of this. So here, the femurs just happen to have ended up blocking the area. Now, what's really interesting here is the abdomen of the wasp is sort of, it's not exploring the, the second leg. It's sort of stuck back here behind the first leg aimed in this direction. This happens every time that the wasp oviposits, not just when the femur happens to be bent in this position. And it's sort of fiddling around in here for a while. And what's what is in this location in, in, is very interesting. Um, the, 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 there is the second thoracic ganglion. And the second thoracic ganglion houses the motor neurons that activate the leg that move the femur. And so that's really interesting, especially because after it fiddles around there for a little while, amazingly, the, the femur moves and the oviposition site is exposed. So that suggested maybe they're actually stinging more times than has been previously reported. And sure enough, um, if you remove the front legs and you look closely, you will see that every female wasp, every time, stings in this general area three times in a row. And you can see the stinger extending and it's extending towards the second thoracic ganglion, which controls the leg. Totally novel site for these stings. And essentially what I want you to see now is what happens with the femur. So you're gonna see the sting, you'll see two of these. and there's hyperextension of the femur. Now compare that to all the other six legs. Here's another example. It doesn't always extend that far, but it usually extends quite a bit. And there's this very wide space that opens up as well. And this is an unusual space here that opens up. Okay, so um, the question was, what if this could be directly visualized? So it's very hard to see where venom goes. In the past, this had to be done by making the wasp radioactive. And my idea was to cut a hole in the cuticle, expose the second thoracic ganglion and see if we could actually see, is it stinging in the central nervous system? And this is what I saw when I did that. So this is actually the first time that we've uh, directly visualized the sting into the central nervous system and this is right where there are two motor neurons that control the leg, where that stinger goes. Actually, it's better than that. It's stinging in the half of the thoracic ganglion that controls the leg on the side that it's going to lay its egg. So it's an incredibly targeted central nervous system attack here and sort of a third layer of neural manipulation in this particular species. So just to reemphasize this, there are frames captured from that. And here is the, the, the sting uh, inserted into the thoracic ganglion as, as venom is deposited. And the likely neurotransmitter, well, the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. So there's probably either acetylcholine, which is actually in some wasp venoms or an agonist. Um, so this is a very tractable thing to follow up and find out what's the mechanism by which the femur extends. And just wanted to show you that in fact, it's a very statistically significant extension of the femur. So these are three time points uh, for 30 seconds before the sting, third, uh, uh, right before the sting, and then 30 seconds after the sting. And it's highly significant um, in that case. Okay, so um, just to sort of summarize what's going on here, um, 
This is what we've known about since 1940-ish, basically that there are two stings. Actually, I should say the central nervous system component of the sting, that it was in the central nervous system, was worked out by the Liebersat lab more recently. And what he showed was basically sting one is in the first thoracic ganglion, parallels the, the, paralyzes the front legs. Sting two is in the brain, causes zombification of the cockroach. Um, but now what we know is there's even a more precise sting. There's, these are stings three to five that cause extension of the femur. And this allows for oviposition. And I just want to reemphasize, you know, how amazing it is that this wasp can target three successive different parts of the tiny nervous system of this host to essentially bend it to its will in order to reproduce. I find that absolutely um, amazing. And if it is successfully done, what you get then is the emergence later, about 45 uh, uh, days later, of the uh, juvenile, of the, of, I'm sorry, of the adult that hatches out. Now, I'm going to show you the emergence because it is strikingly similar to the emergence of the other parasitoid invasive species that we're worried about. It's not only similar in the appearance of the way it comes out, it actually sounds the same. So I'm going to play you the soundtrack here. All right, so there you have a beautiful adult female wasp. Um, and now uh, I just wanted to actually, actually this is gonna get published on Halloween in two days. So that's kind of a fun side to it. And um, I just wanted to then thank everybody for listening and coming, even though we're all digital, even our, our alien here. Um, it's been great to see everybody digitally. Thanks very much. And so now I am going to turn things over to Larissa to talk about ghosts in the darkness. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you can stop sharing your screen. Yes, I'm. Uh, I don't. How do I stop sharing? Um, sorry. I think I can do it. Here we okay. go. Oh, there it is. The big red thing. <laughs> Are you seeing my presenter view? I am. I am. Okay. Is that back to normal now? Uh, now oh, now it's split. Okay. Perfect. Uh, All right. Now it's now it's now. Oh, it's in presenter view. Okay. Hold on. Uh, Is that better? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect. Great, thank you so much. Wow, well, that's uh, ter absolutely terrifying. Um, and so I, I'll continue a bit on a terrifying theme, um, which are talking, or I'll be talking about the ghosts in the darkness. And so the ghosts in the darkness um, is a movie that was made after um, John Patterson published the book, The Maneaters of Zavo. So, Sort of really ready for some terrifying events. Um, I'm going to uh, share a, a brief scene from the movie. Um, the timid should not watch.
Okay, so you might have taken notice of the fact that um, this lion had a large mane. Um, and actually, the man eaters of Zavo did not have these large manes. And the reason for that is, is, is a bit debated. Um, what we do know is based on a firsthand account of um, John Patterson. And he wrote a book, The Man Eaters of Zavo, and, and was very descriptive um, in, in some of his uh, interpretations of what happened. And so I'll let you go ahead with a little bit of a soundtrack and read uh, this first quote to yourself. And then I'll pick up on the second one in just a second. Okay, so you can sort of get a feel um, of what was happening at this time, but essentially um, he also made some other comments, which were things like, I had a very vivid recollection of one particular night when the brute seized a man from the railway station and brought him close to my camp to devour. I could plainly hear them crunching the bones and the sound of their dreadful purring filled the air and rang in my ears for days afterwards. Um, so these lions were really terrorizing um, numerous people in the Zavo region of Kenya in 1898. So to give you a little bit of background, um, John Henry Patterson, he was a civil engineer. He was actually sent um, to uh, this region um, to build a bridge across a particular river. And so this is, uh, and also oversee some temporary uh, bridges so that materials could get moved. Um, he was also a photographer. And so also took these really amazing photos um, of many of these events. This, this photo here uh, is, one of, um, is one of my favorites because it actually shows this temporary bridge. They're moving um, rocks across the bridge and materials and they start to go south and this individual is just about to jump. And you know, this is in the day where you know, setting up for a photograph took quite a long time um, and he was well positioned to take these photos. The other thing I want to point out is sort of the vegetation is it's extremely scrubby and dense. And so this is not your wide open savanna ecosystem that you're typically envisioning when you envision um, large regions of Kenya where you would see lions. This is a very different type of ecosystem. So when they were building the Kenya Uganda Railway back in 1898, shortly after his arrival, um, about a week or so, um, you started to hear uh, incidents of these man-eating lions really wreaking havoc on um, the workers and people in this region. And so it got to the point where people did not feel comfortable um, and the laborers were beginning to not want to work um, in this area because people were being, uh, being targeted and eaten. And there are also photos, which I chose not to include here, um, of two individuals that had literally been dragged from their tent um, and uh, from this lion attack. And we know that at least 28 individuals uh, were killed from these man-eating lions. The estimates, according to Patterson and others, are somewhere up into the amount of about 135. Um, one of the problems is that while they did keep track of workers that they lost, they didn't keep track of everyone um, that was killed. And it was also hard to know a total um, of the individuals targeted by these lions. So the two man-eating lions uh, were shot about nine months later within just a, a few weeks of each other. Um, and this was in December of 1898. Um, and these are the man-eating lions here. Uh, you might notice that they look a little bit different in body size um, and a little bit smaller. And part of that is because they were actually made into rugs um, and uh, Patterson took them home and, and had these uh, lion rugs in, in his house, I presume, um, until about 1925 when he actually sold them to the Field Museum. This is also pretty amazing to look at, which is this is the um, structure that he would climb into and it would actually hunt the lions from. And both of the lions essentially were successfully shot from um, this apparatus. This was a trap that he also made and this door actually slides um, open here. And um, he was not successful in trapping the lions, although they did go to investigate um, those traps. 
So these lions reside at the Field Museum of Natural History. And this is where I think it really gets exciting. Um, we can now you know, study these animals and get a better understanding of their behavior when they were alive and actually compare this to some of these historical accounts. And this is also the point in the talk where I'm going to try to stop terrorizing you um, and, and, and scaring you and actually uh, change the title of my talk to the case of the misunderstood lions with dental problems. And so um, from here on out, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the ways in which we can actually study these man-eating lions and what we've learned. So this is work that was carried out by Yekel and colleagues, um, and they took advantage of these skin. So skins um, essentially have the hair, which is the most recent growth on these animals. And the great thing is all of our tissues, even our breath, um, uh, basically captures what we eat. So you are what you eat. Um, and we can then reconstruct the diets of these animals. So they actually compared the stable isotopes of bones, which is a, a longer term average of the diet of the animal compared to the hair. And so they could actually look at this transition um, between sort of a longer term diet and a more recent diet, which they knew included some people. Um, and so by doing this, they could actually then begin to estimate what the diets of these lions were and as they changed and the percent of people that they might have eaten, including the number of people. So these estimates are somewhere in the range of about 35 people, which is higher than that 28, but it is significantly lower than the 135. Um, but the big question that really um, I was really interested in looking at is why? Can we get at the motivations of these lions? And so this is where I and um, Bruce Patterson, uh, not related to John Patterson, although there are some fun field museum connections. So uh, John Patterson, who had shot these lions, um, he had a, a, a son and that son actually did become a paleontologist and curator of mammals at the Field Museum many years later, and that was Brian Patterson. Um, Bruce Patterson, with a coincidental last name, um, is also the curator of mammals uh, currently um, and wrote a, and studied these man-eating lions and also wrote a book about them, which I'll mention. So um, quite a sort of interesting um, small world story there. But if you take a look at these images, what you'll notice uh, is extreme dental damage. Um, so here you can see that this tooth has abscessed. Um, it has caused the loss of these incisors the over eruption of these incisors and this canine is actually moved over and now occludes um, with this lower uh, canine here. Um, this lion was in a lot of pain and this is one of the man eaters, the man eater that ate the, the highest number of humans. This is actually from another man eater. So this is not the second man eater at Zavo. This is actually a much more recent man eater from the 1990s. Um, and this is the Mafui man eater um, that was shot and killed in uh, um, uh, Zambia. And this is evidence of an ungulate kick to the jaw and likely um, a draining uh, fistula um, that, that would have been extremely painful to this line. So um, not all man-eaters have dental abnormalities, um, but these uh, man-eaters in particular have real extreme um, dental and tooth problems that would have made taking down uh, ungulates or other prey sources very challenging. And so one thing to remember is um, lions really rely on their forelimbs, but they also rely on their teeth to hang on to and hold prey until they die. Um, so they don't have the large saber teeth of so saber tooth cats, the other thing I like to study. Um, and so they really do have to hold on tight and, and, and bite and also use their forelimbs to restrain prey. And if they can't do that, if they're incapable of doing that, um, then they are not gonna be successful at taking down these animals. So we were really curious, were they in fact bone crunchers. And so this is also based on some of the historical accounts. So um, Patterson saying, I could plainly hear them crunching bone. Um, and so we wanted to know, were they sort of desperate and scavenging and just sort of eating any types of foods that they could come across? And is that what actually happened? So I'm gonna just briefly show you what we actually do at the museum um, so you can get a sense of it. Um, but ultimately what we're trying to do is get, take these molds much like you do at the dentist. And so it's the same exact material. We can then make a cast and then we can actually look at that cast under high magnification and get these sorts of images. Um, but we also analyze it in 
sort of um, in three dimensions where we don't actually have to count pits and scratches. We can actually map uh, the topographic surface and analyze it for different features. Um, but essentially what those features are is, you've, um, uh, which I'll show you in a second, is related to the different diets of these carnivores. So for example, um, we have uh, two features. One is called anisotropy, the other is called complexity. And anisotropy tells us something about tough food consumption. And this is our cheetah. We tend to see that we have low complexity indicating softer foods and very tough foods. Um, lots of flesh are being consumed. And we know from observing cheetahs that they actively avoid bone and they prefer and focus on the soft parts um, of the animals that they, they take down and hunt. Um, here, this complexity variable really tells us a lot more about carcass utilization. And so we expect something like a lion to have moderate bone processing, and we expect something like a hyena to show really high complexity values. And we see that. So lions are a bit more intermediate, and our hyenas show these sort of high complexity values. So we know that the method um, works with modern animals that we can actually observe their diet. So now we can actually look at things we can't observe. Um, in a sense, these, these mandating lions are sort of like working on fossils, even though they're not, because we can't go back in time and observe their behavior. But we can um, look at the museum collections and infer their behavior based on the microscopic wear patterns, much like we do with fossils. And so when we do that, what we find is that they ate very soft foods. These red values are the man-eaters. Um, so we've got the two Zavo lions and the Mafui man-eater. And they're um, indicating that they were not eating particularly hard foods. They weren't scavenging um, on carcasses. They were unlikely to be really crunching on bone because we would typically pick up those features. Um, large pits tend to stay on a surface for a, a, quite a period of time. And so we would expect to see those and we don't. Um, the other thing that's interesting is they're very similar to the captive lions and captive lions from zoos we know are typically fed softer foods. This can be ground meats, it can be part like nice parts of um, carcasses where you have lots of fresh meat. And so um, they were eating very soft things. And here's some examples. These are wild caught lions. Here's our zoo lion and here are our man eating lion surfaces. So what we think was the reason behind their man-eating, is that humans were a solution to their dental problem and also to a solution to the lack of prey. So at the same time in 1898, a rinder pest outbreak um, was reducing lots of the uh, prey sources in the area. You also have an influx of people coming in to build the Uganda Kenyan Railroad. These lions also have significant injuries in the case of the first man-eater from Zavo. And taking down prey is not a trivial task and it comes at a high risk and a high cost. And these animals were probably not very efficient at taking down large ungulates, but we were potentially much easier to capture um, and did not exert uh, these sorts of forces um, and were able, were sort of an easy solution to, to their dental problem. Now, um, while man-eating lions and man-eating of various cats is not entirely common, um, it's also not completely unheard of. And so it is happening in, in a fairly high rates in certain areas. So for example, in uh, between January of 1990 and September 2004, there were 815 lion attacks and 563 people killed in just Tanzania. Um, this sort of uh, breaks down the incidence of those different attacks. Um, and this is a subset of the data for which there is sex data related to the victims, whether males or females were targeted and the location in which they were targeted. Um, there's not only man-eating lions, we have man-eating tigers and man-eating leopards. Um, and so this does occur um, and it is more likely to occur when um, there are increased human and big cat interactions in certain areas. So as human population increases, we might expect these negative interactions to also increase. Um, we are a prey species, right? So we, you know, compared to a lion, um, if, if I was, a, you know, if I was uh, um, uh, looking at these, you know, just looking at these, at us from our morphology compared to a lion, as we do with um, uh, ancient humans, 
We know that the, we don't have the same capabilities. We are not the apex predators that we like to think we are um, in many cases. And we have been prey species for quite some time. There's um, real remarkable evidence that uh, ancient um, humans in places like South Africa at Sturkfontein were actually brought into the trees um, uh, by the leopards. And that's how these fossil accumulations sort of uh, resulted. And so if this piques your curiosity, um, the one book I would recommend is by Bruce Patterson, who's the co-author on this study. And it really goes into not just what you know, a, a firsthand account or historic account, but it actually goes into what we know and sort of the science behind it. So it, it's quite interesting as well. Now, I, I want to end on a happy note. So lions and humans can coexist. There have been these problems, um, but there are things that we can do um, to coexist. And this is really in our self-interest and not just for conservation purposes, but also um, to reduce these sort of negative interactions um, that are, are happening. And so some research has been done is looking at sort of livestock um, that have been taken by lions. Um, and what's really interesting, this is done in South Africa, is they painted um, these eyes, these very realistic looking eyes on the rear ends of the, um, of the, of the cow, the, the cattle. Um, and they also had another um, experimental study where they looked at um, X's as instead of eyes, and they also um, didn't do anything. So they had these three different treatments. And what they did find is that none of the lions over a four year period um, actually attacked any of the cattle with the realistic eyes. Uh, four with the X's were attacked and 15 without anything were attacked. And so, um, you know, there's some really interesting, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see how this sort of plays out in sort of an evolutionary framework. If every um, uh, individual has these realistic eyes, will the lions begin to ignore them? Um, will they realize that they're not a threat? Uh, it's sort of an interesting thing that'll, that we'll see how it plays out. But considering that lions are ambush predators and do rely on their prey not actually seeing them, um, this was an attempt to sort of tap into that evolutionary response uh, and reduce these sort of negative interactions. And so at the very end, I just want to leave you, this is about a, a two minute video, um, but it's, it, it's really quite amazing and I'll just let it speak for itself. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. As darkness falls, grazers begin to emerge. Farmers head for the fields, ready for a long night of deer scaring. But with no moon, their difficulty is finding the deer. The lions have the same problem, locating prey from a distance in complete darkness. They can only listen. And this is where the farmers can help. The farmer finds the deer by creating a disturbance. He can see their eye shine by flashlight. All he has to do is chase the deer from his fields and often onto his neighbor's land. Even from two miles away, this sound is like a dinner bell for the lions. They head towards the farmer's calls. Soon, the farmers appear, surrounded by lions, yet completely unconcerned. The big cats have cleared the area of crop pests. And now the farmers too can relax.
This relationship is unique. Lions have adapted their natural hunting behavior from the open plains where they evolved to work alongside humans in these rural farmlands. Scenes like this are increasingly common all over southern Gujarat. After thousands of years of persecution and conflict, lions and people have settled their differences, at least for now. As dark. And with that, I just want to thank everyone who is involved um, with this part of the research that I talked about today in this study, especially um, Bruce Patterson, um, who has been studying man-eating lions for quite some time, and also other lions in the Zava region, um, and also Emily Grassley, who brought attention to this um, and for some of the footage that I, that I showed. Okay, so now we'll open it up to the Q&A and um, Annie Hatmaker has graciously agreed to field these questions. Uh, hi everyone. So um, there is a section at the bottom, the Q&A box uh, where you can put in your questions. And so, so far we have a couple of questions um, for Ken. So I'll just start at the top and we can go through them. Um, first of all is from Gustavo Goldman and he wants to know what is known about the poison injected by the wasps. Yeah, that's an ongoing set of studies. Um, one thing that's known that's pretty clear is that sting number one contains inhibitory neurotransmitters, including GABA and some analogs, I think, um, oh, I forget the other components, but they're analogs of GABA and they, they, they basically uh, inhibit the, the motor neurons and that is what causes about three minutes of paralyzation of the front legs. Um, the second sting, the sting into the brain is much more complicated and they're still working that out. It's for sure what you'd call a witch's brew, meaning uh, tons of stuff in there. Um, one of the things that's in there is dopamine and that seems to induce grooming. So rather than running off, the cockroach sort of just sits there and cleans its antenna while the wasp goes and searches for a hole. So it's kind of amusing to see that effect. But then there are some long-term effects that keep the cockroach from ever really activating any sort of escape system. And it's, I don't think it's clear yet exactly what's going on there. And my Latin, the last thing is, uh, you know, the motor neurons that can, that, so one of the things I think is really cool along those lines is whatever happens in the last stings that I just described that open the leg are the opposite, have the opposite effect of sting one. So instead of paralysis, they activate it. And so I'm really um, hoping that that can be worked out and my money is on acetylcholine. Thank you. Uh, we also have another question for you from David Rinker. Uh, he says, thank you again for the utterly terrifying talk. Um, <laughs> do you have any ideas of the kind of feedback the, wa the wasp is getting through the stinger regarding its position relative to the thoracic ganglia? Yeah, so um, this isn't work by me, but Lieberset, the Lieberset lab that I pointed out has um, essentially examined the stinger uh, for mechanoreceptors and potentially chemoreceptors. And it's certainly covered with a lot of different sensors. One thing I don't know is how does that compare across wasp species? Are they all kind of covered with, with sensors or is this particular to a species that needs to find the brain relative to other soft tissues? Um, in any case, when he ablated those, I think it was by uh, cooling the stinger, freezing the stinger, um, they could no longer accurately target the central nervous system. And then he did sort of a flip set of studies where he took out the brain and the cockroach and then inserted different uh, densities of agarose and, and, the, and the density that, that matched the brain, the wasp stung into, but the other densities it just sort of probed around for a long time and, and really altered its behavior. Um, so it does seem like the stinger is doing something. I mean, one of the things that I was intrigued with in the, in the direct visualization of the stinger going into the second ganglion is the stinger comes out and it probes around a few times. All this happens very quickly, but you know, on the video, it's 
very obvious it's probing the surface of the ganglion, which does have a sheath around it, separate sort of a blood brain barrier, so to speak for the invertebrates. And then once it probes a couple of times, ding, it goes straight in and deposits the venom. So there's something going on, um, but I don't know more details than that. Thank you. Uh, this qu next question is for Larissa. So it's from Destiny Garrett and she is asking, um, are the deer soft and fleshy like humans? Uh, because if not, what happens if one of the lions that live near the farmers has a toothache? Will they attack the humans? Sure, that's a great question. So we actually do see a fair amount of dental damage in lions in general. Um, but in the man eaters, we have seen real extreme dental disease. Um, I will say the deer are probably a lot easier to uh, take down than some of these larger ungulates and so less likely to encourage much damage and from uh, the video footage which actually is available on, T on uh, Tennessee's PBS station there's some curricula that goes along with it too if anyone's interested. Um, but it was a, a pretty quick process. So they probably could, it, it's probably an easy source of food. The hard thing is actually finding them um, at times. And so they really get these cues from um, the humans as to where they are. And it's in the, the humans benefit too, because uh, the deer are actually feeding in some of their areas and reducing um, some of their agricultural uh, uh, products as well. Thank you. Um, Dylan Shropshire asks uh, for Ken, what's the process like for removing the hairs the wasps use to help identify where to place their eggs? It, it was hilarious and I, I'm laughing at myself when I say that because um, basically uh, you, you can't use normal surgical steel and uh, a normal uh, like a number level scalpel blade won't do it, it's not sharp enough. So I had to order obsidian scalpels um, not knowing if those would be sharp. And like, that's the ultra super sharp cutting edge that surgeons will use if they have to do some really fine surgery. And then just imagine, so then holding them uh, is something I, I personally couldn't do with a glove on because the rubber took away the feeling. And so I've got these anesthetized wasps that are waking up while I'm essentially trying to shave their private parts. And they're just like, so anyway, it was sort of the setup for the ultimate fail, I think, but um, it didn't turn out that way. It did work um, ultimately, um, but it was, I was laughing at myself while I was doing it because I thought for sure that when I got stung and then cut my finger with an obsidian scalpel on top of that, it would, it would have been a, a good story, but it didn't happen. Your idea of a good story is uh, a little bit different than maybe some of the rest of us. So uh, Antonis Rokas has a question for Larissa. Um, he says, great talk. Why are we a less preferred food source for lions? Um, aren't we tasty or are we perceived as too dangerous? Yeah, so that's a great question. I actually think we probably are pretty tasty. Um, and I think that that kind of plays into why the man-eating lions sort of you know, they acquire us by opportunity uh, and then they realize that we don't exert as much harm. Um, they don't have a, as, as much pain potentially when taking us down and that we probably taste pretty good. Uh, and so in fact, we are, we are on the menu of many large predators um, and we were in the past as well. And so I think that's, you know, we don't like to think of us as food. Um, we like to think of us as the apex predator because of how we've, um, you know, influenced our, 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 our earth uh, in good and bad ways. Um, but I would describe us as not apex predators. I would describe us as, um, as novel predators in some cases, as prey in many cases. And as human populations grow, we're more likely to be on the menu um, because we're going to be there. I mean, up to this point, I mean, lions are really going after the abundance of prey. They avoid really large things. So they avoid elephants. Um, they tend to eat only juvenile elephants in certain, in certain sort of opportunistic situations, um, but they really are focused on what is in their, their landscape, what they can ambush hunt. And, and we are just as much probably of a yummy tasty treat as, as uh, as anything else. So um, that's why it is important that we figure out ways that we can coexist with lions because we are their prey. Uh, Sharid has a question for both of you, um, separate questions. <laughs> so the first question is for Ken, how long does the cockroach stay alive uh, in the 45 days it takes 
the larva to exit the body as an adult. Yeah, not fortunately for the cockroach, I guess, not all that long once the larva gets inside. Um, you know, if the, if the larva fails, uh, which can happen pretty frequently, um, then actually the cockroach can recover and be supposed it's, you know, close to normal. That's what the study suggests that it's pretty much recovered after about, I'd say two weeks, maybe three weeks. Um, but if w once the larva enters, that is a ravenous larva and um, it eats really fast. Um, and actually I might try to actually follow this up for a publication on looking at the larva behavior because it's, it's, it's wonderfully creepy, um, but uh, not very long. I would say maybe between two, between 24 and 48 hours, maybe a little bit longer. And then it's just been pretty much completely eaten away. And at that point, not long after that, the, the, the larva will uh, basically pupate inside. Um, it'll, it'll spin a cocoon um, and it will stay within that cocoon inside the carcass. Uh, and then, so when you saw the emergence video, that was obviously a dead cockroach. And so it's sort of, but there's a cool side to that. I'll mention that um, uh, a couple of labs in Europe have found that the, um, the, the, basically the larva emits a number of antibacterials because it's going to essentially end up developing inside a carcass. And so it's got a lot of antibacterials and some antifungals that actually are volatile and seem to prevent fungus from growing on the dead body while it's essentially turning into a, a bright, shiny adult wasp. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so more than you wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sharif was the one who asked the question. So he also <laughs> wants to know from Larissa, um, you spoke a little bit about this, but does the man-eating behavior also depend on the availability of natural predators? Could loss of habitat and climate change also result uh, in increase of this behavior? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, what we saw with the Zavo man-eaters was a perfect storm scenario. You had the rinder pest outbreak, you had a high influx of people in the region. Um, so, and you had also the dental problems of these lions. So yeah, all of the above. And that's why we really need to um, sort of better study uh, lions and also try to do these sort of really novel creative approaches to being able to coexist with them. So, yes. And then Ryan Fansler is asking, do recovered cockroaches become better kickers? You know, I've never tested that. Um, I have no idea. I mean, I would guess that they're not, you know, I don't know how to do an IQ test for a cockroach, but um, maybe kicking would be the test. So I, I've never really looked at that. I, I don't know. I will say this much though, only the adults can defend themselves, it, it, uh, it seems. So, you know, it's a lot like the xenomorph situation. You, you, the, the children don't do well. <laughs> I'm sticking with the Halloween theme here. Uh, and then Antonis also has one extra question for Ken. Um, he says that he was, um, very taken with the complexity of the parasitoids actions with the five specific stings. Uh, are there other parasitoids that get away with one or two stings? In other words, any thoughts on the steps by which such a complex behavior evolved? You know, that is, uh, that's in my own mind too, just what the heck is going on with this. And I've got a couple of different ways I'm thinking about this. Well, one is I'm, I'm, you know, I'm absolutely amazed at that species. That's one of the reasons I brought it to the lab in the first place is because, you know, I teach about it in a class and I got intrigued with just what you're talking about. How come, how could this co-evolve and be so complex and, and what seems to be on the edge of failure with a few changes by on the cockroach side? Um, I don't know of any other species. So here's what I don't know. I don't know of any other species that even stings into the central nervous system of the host, period. And what I don't know is that because they just haven't been studied and there's a bunch of them that are out there and it's really common, or is this species really the outlier in complexity of the sort of neurobiological attack strategy? Um, I would love to know whether there's anything that approaches, I mean, on the record, there's nothing that approaches the complexity of this attack. I didn't even, I didn't mention there's actually another sting. There's a, there's a, um, there's a sixth sting that I just don't know where it's going and it's sort of in the paper. So, so the level of complexity is, is really astounding. 
Um, and I just, I just don't know if there's others doing that or if they, if they just haven't been described. Well, thank you everyone so much. I think that we have answered all of the questions that have been typed into the Q&A box. Um, so Larissa, if you wanna talk about the reception. Yeah, so I just put a link uh, in the chat. So if you wanna join us for a virtual reception, we'll be heading right into that reception. And if you have any questions, um, we welcome you to join us there. So thank you everyone um, for, for attending and uh, thank you Dr. Catania for terrifying uh, research uh, that will give us all nightmares through and after Halloween. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much. All right. Thank you.